Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Federal Funding for Legal Aid Part 2. My name is Ali Yang Green, my pronouns are she, her. I'm an Asian woman with long black hair, wearing glasses and a blue top. I work at the Department of Justice, Office for Access to Justice, and I have the privilege of serving as the Executive Director of the Legal Aid Interagency Roundtable. This is the third webinar that Lair is hosting this year, so hopefully many of you are familiar with our work already. At a high level, Lair is a collaboration of 28 federal agencies and offices co-chaired by the Attorney General and the White House Counsel and staffed by my office, the Department of Justice, Office for Access to Justice. Through interagency meetings, initiatives, and community engagement, we strive to achieve LAIR's mission, which includes improving coordination among federal programs, developing policy recommendations, advancing relevant evidence-based research data collection, all to advance across uh, access to justice. You can learn about us, LAIR, and its member agencies and activities at our website, justice.gov backslash ATJ backslash LAIR. Um, all right, so today's webinar is a follow-up to the webinar we hosted in April, where we introduced a new online federal funding resource for legal aid and discussed the basics of a federal grant and strategies to access available resources. I'm going to stop one second to check on the, the chat. Um, I know my colleague Justin from ATJ will be sharing the link to the live captioning, just want to make sure it's coming through, and also link to the slides we'll be using today. So hopefully they'll come through soon. Um, and we developed today's webinar based on the feedback we received from the April webinar and the participants, uh, what they shared. So thank you to nearly 170 people who completed the post webinar feedback survey. It was very helpful to us. We were thrilled to get high marks on the webinar's usefulness and people's satisfaction of the webinar. So many kudos to expert speakers who presented on that webinar. During the webinar and in the feedback survey, people asked questions about how do we access block or formula grants that are not specifically designed for legal services? Where can we learn about the federally approved indirect cost rate, NICRA? and federal funding programs that can support public defense, what are they? So we'll be addressing these topics, plus a discussion about the new rule from the Health and Human Services, which expands potential funding opportunities for legal services to parents, children, caregivers, and Indian custodians with children involved in foster care. We are thrilled to have expert speakers who are joining us today. Um, lastly, about the chat, as Todd mentioned, we invite you to use the chat for questions and comments. Um, generally, we will save the questions until the questions and answer time at the end. Uh, at the same time, we welcome you to thoughtfully share any comments and relevant resources, and I'll uh, pause occasionally to read them out loud um, so that people joining by phone can be uh, following those as well. So, but note that please, uh, too many chats can be distracting for presenters and listeners, so please be judicious in your engagement. All right, so we are going to start with briefly revisiting a, a few key items from the first webinar. Uh, and we're going to start sharing this slide. Perfect. So the slide, okay, great. In April, ATJ and uh, Lair published an online resource that provides a bird's eye view of federal funding opportunities that can support legal and related services. Um, so as you can see on the screen now, it contains links to helpful educational resources and allows you to sort relevant grant programs by issues and by federal agencies. Given that the grant programs, op uh, they open up throughout the year, the programs that are listed on this online page are mostly not currently open for application, but rather from the last three to four years. So this resource can be most useful to gain understanding of the universe of relevant grant programs and to become familiar with the program information and to take a look at past solicitations so that you can be ready when they open up those programs for new applications. And we will update this resource content every few months 
and we are continuing to uh, to look for ways to be more dynamic and use making it more useful. Uh, so now we're going to go back to the slides. And here is again the link to the resource page we we're just showing and a QR code for easy access. Um, next page. Given that the resource shows the relevant opportunities only through April of 2024, here we put together a short list of relevant opportunities that are currently open. Um, and we are going to share, we are sharing the slides um, with the link that was in the chat and also afterwards, so you can take a look at it afterwards too. Um, we have a HUD eviction prevention grant, HUD youth homelessness demonstration program, and then on the next page, we have a Department of Justice, Office of Victims of Crime, Field Generator Solicitation, and uh, another Office for Victims of Crime, uh, meeting the basic needs of crime victims in underserved communities. And then on the next page, we have a two grants uh, from the Bureau of Justice Assistance and Office, for, uh, Office on Violence Against Women, uh, two programs on tribal justice. So I know I went through it really quickly, but this will, th these are on the screen or on the slides that are shared, so you can take a look at it. Now I'm going to invite Karen Lash to join the conversation. Um, she's a senior fellow at Georgetown Justice Lab and also a former DOJ Office for Access to Justice Deputy Director and the founding, founding Executive Director of LAIR, who brings deep expertise and passion for this topic of federal funding for legal aid. So Karen, please come on video. Welcome and thank you for joining this webinar again. Thank you for inviting me back. Um, okay. I have shoulder length black uh, salt and pepper hair, which hints at my age. I'm wearing a purple button down shirt and I use she, her pronouns. Thank you, Karen. Okay, I'm looking at the chat and there are a couple of questions just asking to make sure that we have, we add the link to the slides again. So just, I'm gonna lean on you to share. Great, and there's a password and instructions on how to find it. Okay. And then there's a question about would it be possible to get a link to a recording of the April webinar for those of us who missed it. And that link is on our website. And if you look at justice.gov backslash ATJ, you should be able to find a link to that webinar. All right, turning back to you, Karen. So Karen, thank you, talking about the April webinar last time, you gave a very helpful overview of the federal funding basics starting with the different types of federal grants. Would you be able to give us a quick refresher on those different types of grants, pass-through and discretionary funds? Absolutely. So to oversimplify a pretty complex area, we can still roughly categorize federal funds into two big buckets, discretionary and pass-through funds. So the first bucket I'm calling discretionary, though you may hear those grants referred to as direct grants because you apply directly to the federal agency administering the funds, or you may hear them as competitive grants because you're competing with applicants from all over the country for the funds, but the most common label is discretionary. And that's because the federal agency has discretion based on statutes and rules and lots of process to ensure a fair competition about who will be the actual grant recipients. So the second bucket are federal pass-through funds, including, again, probably familiar terms, block grants, formula funds, and open-end reimbursement funds. That one may not be familiar, but an example of that one is the Title IV-E funds that you're gonna hear about from Allison and Christy. I like to batch them all together under the heading pass-through because of common characteristics that they share. Notably that while they are federal funds, and you should always remember they're federal because there are federal rules and laws and constraints that follow them through, that, but those funds are passed through from a federal agency to state, tribal, and local governments. And that's who makes decisions about how to spend and use those pass-through funds. 
So a legal aid program has the potential to receive funds from that state, tribal or local government administrator. It's a key difference from discretionary grants because you're dealing with your local folks, not the federal decision makers, and you're not competing nationally. Now, in the last webinar, I went into more detail about those common characteristics and the mechanics of pass-through funds. So please watch it if you need a refresher. Ali mentioned that it's on the DOJ Lair website. Yes, and thank you, Justin, for posting the link to the recording here as well. Well, so thank you for this quick recap. And among these two categories of discretionary and pass-through, we got a lot of questions about pass-through grants, especially block grants, well, and formula grants too. People are interested in like nuts and bolts, right? So to start, how do you even find the state or local administrators for those federal grants? Yeah, that is definitely the first step. I call it the Where's Waldo step. Um, who are they? What office are they in? Where do they sit in government? These are all factors that you want to know in order to think through your approach. And it varies dramatically by jurisdiction. So in the last webinar, I used the Victims of Crime Act or VOCA, Victim Assistance Formula Funds example, familiar to a lot of legal aid programs. And where in California, the funds are administered by the Office of Emergency Services. In another state, it's the State Attorney General's Office. In another, it's the Department of Corrections, and so on and so forth. So finding out who the decision makers are in your state is step number one. Now, though it's not comprehensive, um, I've found centralized lists of administrators for a lot of the pass-through funds that uh, where legal aid is an allowable use. Um, and so the next, these, I think there's three slides. Um, so when you get the PowerPoint, you'll be able to click through to the administrator lists. So hopefully that um, helps simplify the where's Waldo step. <laughs> Um, and if anyone finds better or additional leaks, please don't be shy about sending them to me and, and Allie, we really want to stay on top of this kind of helpful shortcut. Well, thank you, Karen. We are so happy to include these in the on these slides and there are quite a few. And so let's say now, you know, who you're going to contact in the state. So what's the next step? Now, the real research starts. How do they make funding decisions? You'll want to know what are their funding priorities? Are funds disseminated through an RFP, through a traditional grant solicitation, or do they contract for services or some combination of the above? Um, so that's part of the research you want to um, uncover. Often the federal statute authorizing the pass-through funding program requires the federal agency overseeing the funds to get detailed state spending plans or strategic plans. They also require frequent reporting about how the funds have been spent in the past. Those documents are extremely valuable for understanding what's happening in your state with those funds, and they are usually findable. You also likely have relationships in state and local government with people that may be able to be helpful or give you some insights about that office or the director of that office and what they care most about and what their um, priorities are. Then there are your peers who have received some of the funds that you're investigating and nothing is better than that kind of hands-on knowledge. So thank you, Sylvia. Um, this is the perfect transition for you to share your uh, expertise on this topic. Well, super, uh, Karen. So thank you for walking through that and really for the helpful list of the state administrators for various agency websites and some from their TTA contractors. So again, uh, for folks who are listening in, the slides that you can view is um, there's a link that you can get from WebEx and we'll also send it out via email afterwards. So now I'd like to invite Sylvia to join the conversation. If you, I invite you to come on video, perfect. So Sylvia Argueta is an accomplished legal aid leader and a longtime executive director of Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles, who has so much hands-on experience that uh, accessing 
pass through funds and we are so thrilled that she's here to share her experiences and expertise as, and insights. So Sylvia, could you please introduce yourself um, a little bit about your organization and your experience with pass through grants. Okay, so I think at the moment you're muted. Yes, again, three, Perfect. four years okay. in and still muting myself. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Ali and Karen and everyone. I'm Sylvia Argueta. Uh, uh, my pronouns are she, her, ella. I am uh, wearing glasses. I'm Latina and I have dark brown hair and I'm wearing a blue and uh, yellow sweater set. So um, I uh, am from the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles. Um, we are a um, LSC uh, funded um, uh, legal services program here in Los Angeles. We are one of three in Southern California. I, I shouldn't say Southern California, in Los Angeles County. Um, and we are celebrating our 95th anniversary. We uh, have grown from having about uh, 30, 33 grants when I became the executive director about 15 years ago to now having over 50, close to applying for two more. So we're, we're nearing on 60 grants um, that we uh, manage in the organization. And we have been the happy recipient of pass through funding applications and um, have had uh, some successes um, in uh, accessing these funds. And I think this is an important topic for all of us in legal services programs to um, understand and know how we can um, diversify our funding streams. Well, Sylvia, when we are having a, a conversation preparing for this webinar, we are going through the list of grants that L, uh, LAFLA, your organization, has been uh, leveraging to serve your community. You know, that included AmeriCorps uh, programs, VOCA, Okay, I'm going to throw out some um, acronyms and you can explain <laughs> them. ERAP, OBW, ARPA, Medicaid, but I will stop there because the list is very long. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, the, the highlights of what are some block grants or those pass-through funding that um, your organization leveraged and how, what their impact has been like? Sure. I, I think I'm going to start with probably one of the most successful ones we've had, which was our America funding that we received um over a decade ago um and that funding uh was initially to fund um our nascent reentry work in the organization um we were able to bring in four fellows um to that work with the Amer americorps grant um and i'm happy to say that as we have continued our relationship in in getting this funding um we have now built a team of 18 staff members who do reentry work in the organization. None of this could have happened without that initial funding from AmeriCorps. And it was leveraging that um, funding to then get support from other entities, both um, city and county and foundations who became very interested, not only in the topic, but just the fact that we had initiated a program with fellows from AmeriCorps. Um, I'm happy to say that we, um, at this moment, still have two of them. Um, who started with us um, and have continued this uh, this this work that is now uh, have been has been the focus of a lot of other funding um, pass through funding that organizations I know are receiving. So that happened because um, we had had AmeriCorps at LAFLA uh, previously that work in our community economic development work, our eviction defense work, um, and we were able to um, apply and we were a known entity to AmeriCorps. So they approved the four fellows, which now has become a full fledged work group of its own in the organization before it was an adjunct to our public benefits work. So that's probably the, the most, I, I think the most successful run we've had um, with a, a grant such as this. Uh, we've had others and, and we continue um, to grow on those in those areas. VOCA funding, for example, is something that LAFLA has worked on and, and received for um, many, many years. And as Karen mentioned, that comes through Cal OES. Um, and I think our, our what I'd like to, uh, maybe I, tell me if I'm jumping the gun, but I think one of the areas that I think um, I'd like to impart on anyone listening um, on this uh, webinar is that it's a, 
how you get this funding is about relationships uh, with cities, with states, with counties, if you have those in your states, um, and with the federal um, administrators. I think it's about relationship building. And once um, folks know that in in um, in those entities understand and know you and know your staff, it becomes much um, easier when you're applying because at times we have been asked, um, are you are you interested in applying? for this grant um, because the expertise that the staff have um, is what uh, city, county, uh, state uh, administrators of these programs know. Um, and I think that that would be, and I might be jumping in front of it, but I think that's one of the successes we've seen. You know, we've also been very lucky in getting um, uh, some of the uh, uh, subgrants um, through other uh, partnerships that we have with community-based organizations, so we will be their subgrantee. Um, but that's happened in trafficking or work that we uh, have received. Um, we also have seen that um, uh, the latest one has been with um, Equal Justice Works and their fellowships, um, the EJW Crime Victims Fellowship grant that we've received through um, that comes as a pass-through through OVC. I think has been very uh, helpful to us in growing um, our. Um, crime victims, a support that we're giving the Asian community here in Los Angeles. All that happens because of relationships that we're making, not only with CBOs, but also with the administrators at these other um, uh, political entity levels, uh, you know, state, local um, levels um, in dealing with folks who understand what legal services programs do, uh, what we bring to uh, the constituents of uh, of various uh, entities, whether it's a city or the state or the county in California. Um, and that's what allows us to have had many successes in getting these types of funds. Well, Sylvia, there was a lot of great information. So I'm just going to say I took three takeaway points. One is you can start small and build it up over time, like the AmeriCorps program economic opportunity. And second, accessing federal funding and building a program with federal funding could have an impact on your ability to get private funding because you become a, a verified entity who can run these programs successfully and responsibly. And the third one is about uh, building relationships with um, local, state, or varying levels of government officials um, and that opening doors. Can you tell us a little bit more about the last point? What does that mean to build relationships? You're not lobbying because you're an, you know, for many reasons. Uh, so how do you go about doing that? So a lot of the, and I want to be sure that I'm clear that it, developing these relationships with government officials, I'm not talking about the electeds necessarily, but it's the administrators. It's the folks who work in those entities, in those city, county, or state entities. Um, they get to know you through um, the expertise of your staff. So this is not a one woman show at all. Uh, it is not me, it is the staff. It is they're bringing their expertise in a specific area. Trafficking, for example, LAFLA has been one of the organizations that you know I, I dare say pioneered some of the early trafficking work that was happening in 1997, 1998. Um, and, um, we worked with city officials, um, administrators who were seeing an uptick in trafficking in Los Angeles. It was uh, initially presenting ourselves as uh, experts in the area or nascent experts and then became experts in those areas and creating a relationship that we can help folks. If you hear about this, going to meetings that are being convened by city or government officials on different topics, um, it's being on top of things. It, it takes a lot of work, but I think um, it works uh, when you have your staff who are the experts in subject matters, attending these meetings, getting to know these city officials and putting it out there that legal services providers can indeed help um, those residents of those, of those cities, of those counties, of the state in, in accessing um, their, their legal um, their legal rights and then developing relationships that last a long time. Some of these folks are 
you know, they're lifelong um, government officials that will be there for a very long time. And they get to know um, not only the organization, but the staff providing the different services, whether it invites, uh, involves trafficking victims or folks now who are reentering society or those who are a particular um, a group such as the AAPI community here in Los Angeles. So, and, and, and that has led us to then um, be kind of a go-to organization when it comes to issues of eviction defense. Um, you know, our eviction program is one of the oldest um, in Los Angeles, um, built in 19 and the 1980s. Um, so folks know that we do this work in, in these government entities. And it, you know, and we hadn't received a lot of money for a very long time until, unfortunately, the eviction crisis um, came to our doorsteps. And that's what has enabled us to receive their knowledge of the work we do has enabled us to receive um, a great deal of funding through ERAP and ARPA funds. Um, but that didn't happen overnight. It was relationship building and ensuring that we made ourselves available to these city officials as experts sometimes on subject matter. Um, and also just understanding, having them understand that, that we do serve a wide swath of, of you know, residents in um, these localities. Thank you so much. Um, Sylvia, I realize I threw, um, used the, the acronym there first. ERAB is an Emergency Rental Assistance Program run out of Treasury and ARPA as well is from the Treasury American Rescue Plan. Is that right? Did I get that right? That's correct. Yes, okay. that's absolutely right. Perfect. So I heard staff expertise <laughs> proving the value to the community, to the government officials. Um, before moving on to the next uh, topic, I know we also heard you talking about the regional collaboration that become uh, that served as a, an important element of you know accessing resources to serve the community collaboratively. Can you share briefly about that? Absolutely. So. In terms of the eviction work that we've been receiving these um, ERAP and ARPA funds, um, it was important, I think, uh, both for uh, the city and county of Los Angeles uh, that we, um, prior to receiving any funding for this eviction crisis, we had built um, relationships with other legal services providers, um, 10 of them, and we also had relationships with community-based organizations. Um, about 16 of them. And um, before um, the COVID pandemic hit, we had formed an alliance of the groups as we were trying to work on right to counsel. And that then became what we now call Stay Housed LA, which is a program of legal services providers, 10 of us and 16 CBOs that work in tandem to provide education training to tenants on their rights and then representation on behalf of the LSPs. Um, that model is the model that um, became the became something that both uh, the county initially was very interested in and said, we you know we're going to put out an RFP. And instead of competing with each other and saying, you know, LAFLA or this other organization, you know, we have wonderful legal services providers in LA, we have NLS, we have Betsadek. Um, uh, public Council, others, um, ICLC, uh, wonderful organizations. We didn't compete with each other. Instead, we said collaboratively, we will come together with the CBOs and apply for this funding. And um, working with county officials, um, and then later on the city wanting to do something similar, working with them, we already had a group of, of vested um, providers, both on the CBO side and the legal services side, who said, rather than having this mishmash of different groups getting a little bit of something, we're going to come together and provide these services. And our pitch was we put tenants first. Um, it became easier because where LAFLA is uh, fortunate, we are the lead agency that, that manages the grants, and we've had to put together an entire infrastructure for that internally um, that's funded by the county and the city. Um, but the reason that happened was they they were very interested in saying, we'll give the one entity the funding and then you take care of the sub grantees. So working with the foundation, the Liberty Hill Foundation, we were able to have them administer the CBOs. We administer the grant for the LSPs and together we work with the county and the city. 
that was very um, unique, um, uh, I think, for both entities to look at. Be, but also it became easier for them because you also have to think when you're applying for these grants, how is it that it's easy for the entity providing you the funding to give you um, that funding because they didn't want to deal with 10 legal services providers and they don't, we do uh, deal with the other nine and we report on behalf of everyone as does Liberty Hill on behalf of the 16. So figuring out how you can work together with other um, groups in LA, we have many, we're very fortunate in your state, um, you may be the only one, um, but they're also community-based organizations. And how do you collaborate? And some of these grants that I've mentioned, like the trafficking grant, we've done the same thing. We've worked with the Thai Community Development Center as a subgrantee of theirs on some of this trafficking uh, funding from OVC. That is through relationship building. And I think that when you apply, um, even as a subgrantee through another entity, there are opportunities that we shouldn't miss just because we think, um, and I love that, you know, one of the first slides we saw was direct applications versus uh, the pass through or block grants. Um, that's important to remember that there are so many other opportunities and pass throughs because there are non legal services providers who are your partners already that you can apply together or you can apply as their sub. You don't always have to be the lead, even in, a, in getting a pass through funding. Thank you for sharing that experience and the insight. And uh, the grant you referenced was a human trafficking grant from the Department of Justice Office yes. of Victims of Crime, where it went to a Thai Community Development Center and at LAFLA, your organization was a sub grantee. Correct. Great, okay. Correct. Well, I know there are some questions that came through. We may save them until the Q&A later, and we'll move on to the next uh, segment. We'll, we'll again engage in a conversation with Karen and Sylvia. So, at the last webinar, um, we had a Montana Legal Services Executive Director, Allison Paul, who addressed the question about the high administrative costs of administering federal grants. And I think people have seen questions for you, Sylvia, later. Um, and at that time, Allison shared that Montana, her organization, had a negotiated indirect cost rate, better known as uh, NICRA, uh, N-I-C-R-A which for Montana has been instrumental to cover the overhead costs and allow them to serve as a pass-through intermediary for those grants administered collaboratively with other legal aid and community-based community, community -based organizations. And people had a lot of questions about what is it? How do we do that? How do we, um, what, what do we need to know about it? And this is a rather complex topic and after talking about this topic with Karen and Sylvia, we'll, um, so that's the conversation we're gonna have, and we will share several resources, uh, some training videos and written reference materials uh, that are already prepared by federal agencies that you can review and share with your development and finance colleagues. So we will actually start with Karen. So Karen, uh, if you may, uh, please come back onto video and there you are, and we are going to put you back on stage. Perfect. And let's see, thank you for coming back to talk about this topic. So let's start with the basics. What is NICRA? So technically speaking, it's a federal document agreed on by you, your organization and the federal agency that provides your organization with its largest federal grant. In federal speak, the agency that is the source of your largest federal grant is called the Cognizant Agency, and that's who you'll be dealing with. So together, you'll work out your actual indirect costs. These are generally the non-programmatic costs of administering a particular federal grant. That uh, would include some portion of the executive team and management time, your human resources, finance, and IT departments, and the salaries and fringes of that portion of those staff, plus some supplies probably, and maybe the facilities costs of the square feet that they use. So the bottom line is that these are the expenses that enable your organization to operate efficiently, to manage funds responsibly, and support and expand your program staff and the services that they provide. And here's the headline. Without a NICRA, 
some of you are leaving money on the table because in many cases you aren't recovering the actual costs of administering those federal programs. And we can be honest here, federal programs require a lot to manage and administer. And your organization doesn't need to be subsidizing a federal grant. So those indirects enable your operations and ultimately the reason legal aid exists, which is to serve clients and communities. Thank you for that, um, NICRA 101. So my understanding is that many legal aid organizations do not have a NICRA, the negotiated rate for indirect, which can commonly be anywhere between 20 to high 30s in percentage, right? And that's a rather something commonly used by universities and large uh, NGOs and non-governmental organizations. So Karen, why don't more legal aid organizations get and use a NICRA? You make it sound like it's a no-brainer. So for those legal aid programs that have a sizable portion of their overall budget from federal sources, I think it probably is a no-brainer. But I asked Allison from Montana Legal Services, who was on the last webinar, for some tips because they have an ICRA. She would say that a major factor in deciding if it's a no-brainer depends on first determining the percentage of federal funding that you get. If it's a lot, that helps you decide whether it's going to be worthwhile to go through the process. So, for example, her program is roughly 35% LSC funded and 35% a mixture of other federal funds. 35% from multiple federal sources was enough to tip the scales for them. And their calculus was it's worthwhile to get their real indirect and management expenses covered so they have the capacity to manage the federal funding and run a really top quality program. Now, despite my enthusiasm, um, getting a NICRA is not the right decision for every organization. Each of you have to study the, the unique to you pros and cons in order to decide, does it make sense? Um, I can also understand why some of our audience may just shake their heads and throw up their hands once getting into the weeds of this rather complex federal process. But please trust me, it's worth figuring out if it's right for your organization. So I have a few more tips on all of that. So first, go directly to your finance folks to help you figure this out. They speak this language fluently. I admit, I do not. But you have experts in your organization who can follow NICRA's multi-step process and really help you consider how it applies to your unique situation and program. Second, um, it, it may be kind of painful and it requires some resources, but going through the process of getting a NICRA can help simplify a lot of things about operational costs and how to track them consistently and within federal compliance requirements. So the footnote here is to plug the federal compliance article in the recent Management Information Exchange Journal that I did with Scott Scheffler and Rosie Griffin in the federal grants practice at the Feldsman Lifer Law Firm. And we distributed it in the last um, webinar, but I think somebody's gonna drop the link. Yeah, okay, great. Um, and really just um, consistent with overall compliance considerations, which is what that article really covers. And it touches on NICRA, but covers a lot of other topics. But the NICRA forces the organization to have a clear, concise cost allocation plan, which all funders need, and is a best practice for tracking organizational costs. And it's essential for any audits. Um, and all of that is just relevant to compliance best practices. So the third tip, and this is really huge, I kind of buried the lead, is that once you have a NICRA, in most cases, local, state, and other federal agencies must honor your NICRA. Even some foundations may recognize NICRAs in their grant budgets, given giving you access to that higher indirect rate. So if in your analysis, the pros outweigh the cons, 
NICRA will help ensure you have capacity to comply with, let's admit it, the more onerous requirements of the of federal grants. Well, Karen, thank you for walking us through um, those points. So in your last little bit, you said something about the onerous part. So can you say a little bit more about the actual process that may include that onerous element? Yeah, yeah. So because really describing the NICRA process, including the onerous parts, would take up the whole webinar. Um, today's goal is just an overview of what's the big idea and the reasons to consider it and give you some resources to help you. So on that latter score, I'm happy to say that the nuts and bolts of the NICRA process specifically for legal aid is outlined in another article I did with Scott and Rosie from the Felsman Law Firm, this one focusing just on NICRA and indirects. It will be in a future issue of the Management Information Exchange Journal, but MIE very generously gave us the okay to share the near final draft before publication. It's super detailed, maybe painfully so, but the goal was to just demystify the process, help you understand it, so I will refer you to the article to get in those kind of messy weeds. So uh, I did somebody put it in? Yeah, yeah it's the there. Link. Okay, great. So between the Lair team's collection of federal agency NICRA resources, this deep dive article, um, and then consulting with your accounting team, you're, you should have what you need to decide whether a NICRA makes sense for your organization. Karen, um, can you touch on the default choice that many legal aid programs make, taking the what you call the de minimis rate for indirect, which I know is changing this year from 10% to 15%? Definitely, this is key to your pros and cons analysis. It's the, the NICRA alternative is this super popular de minimis indirect cost rate. And it may make sense to just go with that instead of jumping through hoops to negotiate a unique rate. The Office of Management and Budget, or OMB, they created this as a no-fuss option. A grantee just chooses to apply the de minimis rate and say so in their grant applications without all the justifications. There are some limits and some other considerations that you should factor in, and those we touch on those in the MIE Journal NICRA article, um, including on the plus side, as you mentioned, um, Allie, that OMB's longtime 10% rate is going up to 15%, and that'll all happen no later than October 1st um, of this year. So it's tempting, it's simpler. Um, with the proviso that many programs, actual indirects are still likely to be higher than that 15%. Yeah. All right, well, Karen, any final thoughts before we move on to um, Sylvia? Um, well, first, uh, just a note about LSC grantees that you should all always consider how this applies to you and consult your LSC financial guide and relevant program letters. Um, and the National Legal Aid and Defender Association's Chris Berger, who's chief counsel for civil legal services, he's told me that I can say he's happy to talk to people about the LSC um, rules and regs. And we can share his uh, email, which is c.buerger -E at nlada.org. And then, and really just in closing, is just that I promise that the potential benefits really make it worth your time to understand the NICRA process and just weigh the pros and cons for your program. All right, well, perfect. Thank you so much for sharing your NICRA 101 and more. So thank you, Karen. And now I wanna bring back Sylvia into the conversation. Again, Sylvia, the Executive Director of the Legal Aid Foundation of LA. So. Tell us uh, about your experience. Does your organization have a NICRA? Uh, how do you handle the indirect costs? Curious of your perspective as a legal aid organization leader. So um, I appreciate this conversation and definitely the article, Karen. Um, we do not have NICRA. 
at LAFLA. It has proven to be an onerous process. Um, you know, the finance team at LAFLA um, had uh, prepared uh, our NICRA uh, for um, a grant that we have. You have to have federal funds and um, came up against a very frustrating scenario where um, once we got it together, the agency was like, you know, we, uh, we're, we've run out of funds and they couldn't approve it. So we have defaulted and I'm glad Karen brought this up to the modified total direct costs. Um, it's, as you say, much simpler, but I really do want to emphasize that we are still working on applying for NICRA um, and um, while it is easy to to say, you know, the uh, MTDC is is much simpler. You are leaving things like, for example, rents um, on uh, on the table, um, and NICRA does give you more funding. We um, have uh, we're happy to see that you know we could um, uh, the. Uh, amount of money for MTDC is increasing from 10 to 15 percent in October. We also know that um, uh, you can include up to the first $25,000 that we pay a subcontractor as part of MTDC, and that'll increase to 50,000 in October. Um, I believe that's right, and and so that's a good thing. But I I can't echo enough what Karen said that we are leaving money on the table um, by not having NICRA. Even with MTDC, it doesn't cover as much as NICRA, and um, it's been a, a goal of us at LAFLA to essentially not do that. And, and, and when you talk about other funders asking for that, you know, the city of Los Angeles, especially um, a huge funder for us, um, ask for that. They're, they'll ask, you know, do you, do you get NICRA? And because we do not, um, we have, um, I believe, left um, a little bit too much money on the table. So I can't emphasize enough how it, is. it can be an onerous process. It can be sometimes frustrating, but I think in the end, um, it allows you, especially as we're looking at different funding streams and some of them potentially going down, that it's something that we can't afford to do in legal services. Thank you, Sylvia, for sharing that perspective. Um, I wanted to take a moment to share some of the resources that we pulled together on this slide, which has been shared with you through the links in the chat, but it's hot if you're able to bring it up, that'd be great. Um, here, we have some examples from the Department of Justice, Department of Labor, AmeriCorps, and USAID, where agencies have developed a pretty extensive guide and information about you know, uh, the educational resources for potential grantees on indirect cost. The one from DOJ in particular is a webinar, which I find uh, to be very useful. Um, and the next slide. Here, uh, we included some additional resources relating to the change, the, uh, the uniform guidance update that uh, Karen and Sylvia referenced earlier. The first one is the link to the White House announcement on this update from April 2024. It emphasized that the change aims to streamline the requirements, reduce barriers to entry, and to ensure that the federal financial assistance serves the intended communities and took a, a number of measures and among other things, they eliminated the requirement to use English language in notices, applications, and reporting for assistance programs. The change is effective of October 1st of 2024 and relevant to the conversation, there is a de minimis indirect rate change from 10 to 15, but there are many more significant changes that would matter to you. So I encourage you to learn more about uh, this change. And there's a resource, the last bullet. This is a, the .gov a resource from the Chief Financial Officers Council, uh, which is a group led by the federal agency CFOs. The first one is a set of reference guide, which is quite extensive. And uh, the other one is, um, is listed as two CFR revisions 2024, an official comparison version. So it's basically a red line version, which I found it to be quite useful to look at and get a sense of what the changes are. So again, um, all this is in the slides, which are shared through the link, but also we will um, send um, the slides after after the webinar. Okay, great. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Now, I see there are a lot of chat. Okay, we are going to review the chat information and address some of the questions during the Q&A. But at this time, we're going to move to the next topic. Um, let's see. And we're going to shift gears to discuss the opportunities relating to foster care, focusing on the impact of the new foster care legal representation rule from HHS. And for that conversation, we're going to turn to Christy Lamble from Children's Bureau. Thank you for coming on video. And Allison Green, legal director of the National Association of Council for Children. So I'm going to change the staging. Remove from stage. One second. Perfect. Thank you. All right, Christy, um, we'll start with you. Thank you so much for joining the webinar today. Uh, will you briefly introduce yourself and about your office and tell us about the new rule and how it's being implemented? Thank you so much, Ali. Good morning and good afternoon. My name is Christine Lamble, and as Ali mentioned, I work in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Administration for Children and Families in the Ch Children's Bureau Policy Division. I'm a Caucasian woman with uh, blue-gray eyes and brown hair, and today I'm wearing a gray suit jacket. Um, I have the pleasure of providing a very brief overview of the new regulation for foster care legal representation that was recently issued by ACF. In the chat, I'm going to provide some resources um, for some of the things I'm gonna talk about today. Let me see if I can get that. All right. So I'm not sure how familiar, familiar you are with the Title 40 foster care program. So by way of a brief background relevant to today's discussion, um, as Karen mentioned earlier, Title 4E of the Social Security Act provides funding for the federal foster care program as an open-ended entitlement grant. Under the statute, the state and tribal Title 4E agencies can claim federal financial participation for 50% of allowable administrative costs necessary to administer the Title IV-E foster care plan. The agency must pay the non-federal share using state or tribal funds. In addition, federal policy in the Child Welfare Policy Manual allows Title IV-E agencies to claim administrative costs for legal representation provided by an attorney representing children who are at imminent risk for entering foster care and children in Title IV foster care and the children's parents in all stages of legal proceedings. There are also federal regulations at 1356-60C that provide examples of allowable administrative costs. And again, links to all these resources are in the chat. Next slide, please. So on May 10th, 2024, ACF published a final rule for allowable administrative costs for representation in foster care and civil legal proceedings and issued an information memorandum announcing the final rule. Next slide, please. So the final rule adds a new paragraph four to those regulations at 1356-60C that identify allowable administrative costs. First in paragraph four, one little i, the final rule codifies existing policy that Title IV agencies are allowed to claim federal financial participation for the administrative costs of attorneys providing legal representation in foster care proceedings. Next slide, please. Paragraph four, two little i, codifies existing policy and expands it. A Title IV agency can claim administrative costs for independent legal representation provided by an attorney representing a child in Title IV foster care, a child who's a candidate for Title IV foster care, the child's parents, the child's relative caregivers, and the child's Indian custodian in foster care and other civil legal proceedings when the legal representation is necessary to carry out the requirements in the Title IV agency's foster care plan. 
Um, I want to note that both the notice of proposed rulemaking and the final rule provide examples of what we mean by other civil legal proceedings. Next slide. And finally, under paragraph four, three little i, a Title IV agency has the option to claim federal funding for an attorney or non-attorney representing an eligible child's Indian tribe in state court foster care and termination of parental rights proceedings. So now that we have a final rule, what's next? Um, Title IV agencies that already claim independent legal representation under the Child Welfare Policy Manual may continue to do so. Um, a Title IV agency that opts into claiming independent legal representation as described in the rule needs to amend their public assistance cost allocation plan uh, or tribal cost allocation methodology and report the information on the Children's Bureau Form 496. Um, we want to encourage providers of legal representation to first contact your Title IV agency in your state or tribe for assistance. This is because they're the only ones who can answer questions about whether they're going to claim allowable costs for legal representation under the new rule, any related state or tribal laws and policies, and information on claiming, building, billing, and contracting. So thank you again for your time today, and I'm going to turn it back over to Allie. Thank you so much, Christy, for um, sharing this information. So please stick around in case people have any questions. But we'll turn to Allison Green to give us more of a kind of practical perspective of what it all means for legal aid organizations. Thank you so, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Allison Green. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am the legal director at the National Association of Counsel for Children. I am a Caucasian woman with my brown hair, worn pulled back, and a gray shirt. So hearing about this new rule from Christine, you may be a attorney or a leader in your jurisdiction who's wondering like, okay, what next? Um, this new money is available to us, but how do we access it? How can we take advantage of it to serve children, parents, and families in our community? So I'm going to offer you a few tips to jumpstart uh, implementation and communication on this in your jurisdiction. First and foremost, this all begins through a strong partnership with your child welfare agency. These funds are in the pass through bucket. So if we go back to earlier and Karen's first slide in the presentation, we saw we, she blocked discretionary and pass through. These are pass through funds, which means legal aid organizations cannot apply for them directly through to the federal government you must have a partnership so that it can go through the Title IV, T, Title IV E grant agency, which is usually the child welfare agency. So that's the place to begin. Importantly, the funds are an opportunity, but not a mandate for that child welfare agency. So a good approach is to be extremely collaborative and be open that there may be some push and pull at the beginning because this is new in many places. There is an element of this new rule that codifies existing funding that had been flowing for the past five years to support child and parent legal representation in, depend in the dependency cases. According to the most recently released federal report, about 26 states and three tribes are already drawing down that funding. And I'll note that that report comes out on a delay. I think there's quite a few more uh, by this time using it. In those successful jurisdictions, we have seen a variety of approaches to these partnership relationships between the legal aid organization and the state child welfare agency. In some places, the states chose to start with parent representation first and wait and delay on child rep. Other places did the inverse. Some states are funding attorneys who work um, in a solo capacity. Others are supporting attorneys working in multidisciplinary legal models that include an attorney, a social worker, and a peer partner with lived experience in the child welfare system. Some states went statewide with their implementation right away, 
while others preferred to start with a pilot in a specific city or county. There's a large menu of opportunities to choose from. And so I think that's just the most important thing to go in with the spirit of kind of partnership and experimentation. You all now have uh, quite a bit that could be accessed, which includes that funding for representation in dependency cases, but also goes more upstream to civil legal aid matters that can prevent a child from coming into foster care, civil legal aid matters that may be related to a child who's come into foster care, but not the family um, law matter specifically. For example, if a parent needs housing advocacy in order to secure an apartment and reunify with their child, or if an older youth who's aging out of care needs assistance with expungement or credit um, issues or an appeal of a public benefit so that they can successfully transition to adulthood. The new rule also opens this up to kin as well as tribal legal representation. So there's quite a bit to choose from. And I think when you come to those initial conversations, you have to be ready to ask for it all, but be, but be ready to compromise and negotiate and realize that there may be some pacing to this as it's rolled out. Second, invite the right stakeholders to those conversations. Of course, that's going to include the legal advocacy community and the child welfare agency, otherwise known as the 4E grantee, but there are others who are going to enrich the conversation. Uh, first, judicial leaders. Um, judges often play a very helpful role in these conversations. Of course, they're not going to make the final decisions, um, not like they do in legal cases, but having a judicial leader in the room, they play an important role as a convener. You know, when judges convene a meeting, participants are frankly more likely to show up. <laughs> um, they have a legitimizing factor in places that might still be questioning this and saying, why would I draw down money to help my legal adversary in the courtroom? Judges legitimize the importance of this for the jurisdiction. And they help bring accountability to those conversations, making sure that items that are promised to be done are followed up at the next meeting. Second, lived experience experts. By that, I mean individuals who have experienced the foster care system directly, either as a child or a parent, should be in the room. Um, they are going to be able to ground your conversations in the what that needs to happen um, and to anchor the group back um, towards making critical choices. And they're gonna be able to help you see things, blind spots that you may have in your own thinking. And then court improvement program officers or CIPs. CIP is a formula grant that de supports dependency court improvement in every state. Every state has a CIP officer and that person is required currently to have a project on quality legal representation. They're also required to have a joint project with the child welfare or foster care agency. So talking to your CIP and investigating, hey, what are your projects? Could we align with those in the use of those fundings? Might be a very good place to start. Third, uh, familiarize yourself with your jurisdiction's child welfare data and goals. There is plentiful research to show that civil legal aid reduces, and in some studies has even eliminated the need for foster care removal. And when removals do occur, research also indicates that high quality legal representations accelerates case outcomes, getting kids safely out of care up to 40% faster, and, and is linked to other positive outcomes like better school stability and more, um, more feasible kinship placement. All of these things, school stability, kinship placement, permanency, are shared goals of the agency. Many of them are also working towards those goals for other reasons. Every state is subject to a federal audit that occurs every few years known as the Child and Family Service Review, or CFSR. After those audits are complete, every state enters into a PIP, or Performance Improvement Plan, which is an essentially an agreement between states and the feds to address deficiencies in state systems. In addition to these PIPs, states also are often um, operating under class action settlements, yet another legal obligation. 
uh, that drives their systemic reform and improvement. Your influence and your success in broaching these conversations will be greater if you can align with those goals, uh, which is you, you, you want to frame the drawdown of this money, not as something new or additional, but as, hey, here's a new driver that we can use to support what you're already working on, because you're already working on safely reducing the foster care population. You're already working on trying to get more kids placed with kin. Let's help you do that. Many of us believe, you know, even if these outcomes didn't exist, that legal representation would still be fundamentally important because it comports with our values and our feeling of constitutional due process. And that's true. Um, but in addition to that, the research also really helps our case. So bring that research, bring the data to those conversations. Um, it, it would also help you make those decisions about where should we begin. Fourth, measure, measure, measure. Uh, we have some great studies in the field, but we always need more. Um, so from the very outset, track and evaluate your outcomes. Um, this will help grow a pilot into a larger statewide project eventually. It will also help build your arguments for state revenue investment in these programs. It may also help peer states in your region who are struggling to get started. I've seen a lot of states that look to their um, other peers to say, okay, well, if they're doing it, we can do it too. Fifth and lastly, um, you're going to want to remain open to blending and braiding funding. Um, Title IV-E is, is not a full 50% match. Um, as Christine mentioned, it's a 50% match in eligible cases, which um, is a financial calculus that varies on a state by state level. So the 4E alone is not going to be a silver bullet, but it's a huge new and exciting piece of the funding puzzle. Be sure to look at other funding sources that can help support child welfare and civil legal aid that prevents the need for child welfare, like VOCA grants, like STOP grants. Remember that federal funds cannot match other federal funds. It has to be a state to st federal match, although LSC funds are an exception to this. Overall, the federal government has set the table with this really exciting new rule, but it's up to the advocacy community to knock on the door of child welfare agencies um, and make it happen. Start asking, be politely persistent. Uh, agencies have a lot on their shoulders with many competing initiatives, um, but you have the research and the data on your side to show that this can really make a difference. Well, thank you so much, Allison, for sharing um, so much information as well as good tips and, um, and guidance on how to move forward. There are a bunch of questions that came through the chat, which we'll turn to after the next segment, but I do want to ask, uh, that you had shared uh, an article you wrote on this topic. Are we good to share in the chat? Yes. So people can take a look. So we'll go ahead and do that. And also I'm curious about how, if your organization or what other resources people can look to or learn about some uh, legal aid programs across the country, maybe actually tapping into utilizing this funding to support their work. Um, thanks. I dropped the article in the chat. I'm also going to put in the chat other relevant federal guidance. So um, as Christine and I both um, alluded to, parts of this funding had been flowing prior to its codification in the, new rule, in the new rule. And the Children's Bureau had released a few very helpful pieces of technical guidance, um, some of which highlight promising programs. Um, one is an information memorandum on civil legal advocacy that prevents the need for foster care. The second is an information memorandum on the use of Title IV E funds and promising programs specifically. And the third is an FAQ document or frequently asked questions document um, that really gets in the weeds and the nitty gritty. Um, inevitably, when you start these conversations, finance staff should be in the room and be at the table. And you're probably going to start, if you're not a finance person, getting questions that get a little murky or confusing. I know that happens for me, uh, but these documents do a really helpful job of answering those questions. 
Well, thank you for sharing the information, including the articles and resources and to HHS Children's Bureau for the resources. So we'll come back to you all for during the Q&A. So thank you for sharing this information. And my ATJ colleague, Nikhil, has been patiently waiting <laughs> to share um, really important information as part of the webinar as well. So as folks know that while this webinar focuses primarily on opportunities for civil legal aid, we know many organizations provide both criminal defense as well as civil services or work closely with those that do. So in response to a question at the last webinar, someone asked whether there are any federal resources supporting public defense. We invited my uh, Department of Justice colleague, Nikhil Ramnani, to share some information. So thank you for coming on. So Nikhil, turning to you, will you please briefly introduce yourself and about the resource? Thank you, Ali. My name is Nikhil Ramnani. I'm a South Asian man with a beard, wearing a blue and white Oxford shirt and a blue blazer. I use he and him pronouns. I'm a senior counsel at the Office for Access to Justice. And as Ali mentioned, I lead our work supporting state, local, and tribal public defense. Thank you for the opportunity to present an overview of the Office for Access to Justice's online resource, the Public Defense Resource Hub, or as we like to call it, the PD Hub. The PD Hub aims to be a one-stop destination of resources and materials to support individuals and organizations involved in public defense. It was launched in March 2024. It collects existing resources for professionals providing public defense services from across the federal government. Currently, the Public Defense Hub comprises of four distinct sections. Collect funding opportunities from DOJ and other federal agencies court filings in support of public defense, DOJ funded or authored reports uh, and research related to public defense, and relevant DOJ news that impacts public defense. Let's pull up the website and talk about these features in a little bit more detail. The first section, I'm going to go in reverse order and end the presentation with select federal funding opportunities. The first section is titled court filings in support of public defense. This includes statements of interest or SOIs pursuant to 28 USC section 517. The attorney general is authorized to file statements of interest or amicus briefs in any state or federal trial or appellate case to attend to the interests of the United States. We've compiled a copy of all statements of interest or amicus briefs related to the uh, provision of public defense on this page, and we hope to populate it with further statements of interest. The second section is news, and it collects foundational DOJ documents and other news reports about DOJ engagement, initiatives, and remarks related to public defense. The third section, research and reports, is a partial collection of all DOJ public defense resources and researches research related to the provision of indigent defense services. Some of these links, and I want to point specifically to uh, the BJA library, are very comprehensive and lead to extensive libraries that go back almost 50 years of research that DOJ has supported and funded in relation to public defense. But finally, and the purpose of this webinar is to introduce folks to the Select Federal Funding Opportunities section of the PD Hub. This section is aims to identify federal funding resources from DOJ and other federal agency, which can be used primarily to <clears throat> provide criminal defense services, either attorneys or paralegals, or justice workers, including social workers, mitigation specialists, or navigators linking folks to substance use or mental health treatment that serve in more holistic function offices of public defender offices. We're also looking to respond to uh, field inquiries and requests. Um, we've received a wide variety of requests for funding resources, including fleet vehicles, transportation, software and hardware funding resources for improved data collection and case management, um, and loan forgiveness for public defenders. And we hope to populate this in the coming months with responses to those as well. You'll notice that there's only about 10 resources identified here. 
ATJ staff is working this month to update and populate the select federal funding page with approximately 25 additional resources, some that have been expired, but hopefully that will be projected for fiscal year 2025 as well. Finally, in closing, <clears throat> oh, one additional thing, each of the opportunities uh, presented here aims to describe the purpose of the funding, explain specifically how public defenders can access the resource, note relevant deadlines and entity restrictions given the structure of the public defender offices, and highlight how public defenders have used the money to support public defense in their respective jurisdictions. Uh, we will be hosting this exciting development. We'll be hosting a fall webinar specifically on federal funding for public defense providers. So stay tuned onto the hub for additional details related to that webinar. We also welcome direct contact or input on challenges and successes in accessing federal funds for public defense. We hope to publish a toolkit as well in the late fall to address these issues. My email is contained on the landing page of the PD Hub, and you can contact me there if you have any additional questions or would like to discuss specific federal opportunities. Back to you, Allie. Well, thank you so much, Nikhil, for sharing that fantastic resource and the announcement about the upcoming uh, webinar as well as a toolkit that uh, the team is developing. So if the folks have noted that you're interested in getting future correspondence in your uh, webinar registration, you will receive a notification when additional webinars that are hosted by DOJ Office for Access to Justice. So, um, but if you did not, you can let us know. We'll be happy to add you to the email list. Um, I want to note that, that we had a chat uh, entry stating that thank you for including information on public defense funding. Um, we are very glad that Nikhil is here to share that information as well. So it's been more over an hour and actually only 10 minutes remaining, but we do have some question, time for questions and answers. Um, I'll start out by uh, reading out some of the questions that are listed in the chat and the responses that some speakers already noted. If there are any additional ones, please feel free to add them in the, in the chat. Um, and as a very quick one, would you kindly post a contact email? All the email, addre email addresses for the speakers um, are in the slide. So it's in the, the slides that you can download for the webinar um, from WebEx, the staging page, as well as uh, the follow-up email we'll be sending. And we can certainly add them here as well. Um, so I will start with the um, relating to the, the foster care legal representation. There's a question in the chat. So when it says proceeding for the foster care placement or termination of parental rights, does that mean the ability to provide attorneys for tribes is limited to only certain stages or hearings in child welfare cases? So I'm going to read the response that Christy from the Children's Bureau noted, and Allison, if you have any additional uh, comments, you can share. Uh, Christy noted that funding is available for representation of a child's tribe in state court fo uh, foster care proceedings in which the Indian Child Welfare Act applies. Do you have any, any other comments, responses, Allison? Um. I think I would just add it, it's available. The renewal clarifies it's available for participation in in the actual case, but also participation in general. Even if this, even if the tribe does not want to formally intervene as a party, it leaves discretion to the tribe to do so. All right. Thank you. There was another related question. What if your state welfare child welfare agency, the Title IV pass through agency, does not currently have a state plan? that addresses legal representation for parents. Christy helpfully noted in the chat, a Title IV-E agency is not required to submit a Title IV-E plan amendment in order to qualify for funding. The agency must only amend their public assistance cost allocation plan. Right. Any other response? That's right. Yeah, that, that, that's right. So they, um... You know, there does have to be an agreement to do this. 
agencies are accustomed to updating these things. These are living documents. Um, and so, yes, the, the public cost allocation plan or PCAP does need to be updated, but it can be, and many states have done it and will continue to do it. Okay. And I think this is a question for Allison. Are PEEPs, PIPs, uh, publicly available or does uh, FOIA, maybe it meant FOIA requests have, have to be made? They are publicly available and I put the link to the portal in the chat. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. I see the, the, the link that you put in PIPs and CF SRs are publicly available here. And this is a HHS.gov link. Thank you. There's one more question uh, for the, the foster care team. It's my understanding that the Title IV money can also be used for pre-petition legal representation, i.e. when a child is at risk for entering foster care to help prevent entry into foster care. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. So that's the kind of the big and exciting part of, of the new rule. Um, and I think in the um, language on Christine's slide, it has that, um, that it is for candidates for foster care. Um, that means you, children who may be at risk of entering where the child welfare agency is involved in some capacity, making reasonable efforts to prevent a removal. Um, it doesn't apply to all children. It doesn't apply to a child who has not had contact or engagement with the agency, but it absolutely applies to candidates uh, for foster care. All right, well, thank you. Now I'm gonna move up to the section of talking about indirect costs. All right, uh, and this is the a question that Karen might have already answered. There's a question in the chat. I think it does not, the indirect cost uh, change, um, does not take effect until October, but correct me if I'm wrong. This is relating to the OMB, um, the uniform guidance update. Karen Lash noted that agencies can choose to adopt the 15% de minimis before October 1, but it will be in effect across all agencies in October 1, 2024. Okay. Um, and there are a few other questions relating to the indirect costs. If Karen and Sylvia would like to come back on video and there are other questions relating to block grants. Okay. All right. So there's a question. I am still seeing the reference to 10% de minimis in new grant announcements, e.g. HUD eviction prevention program. Should we go ahead and ask for 15%? Um, if it says 10%, don't assume you can do 15, but you may, it may be worth asking whomever is the contact, uh, um, on, in the solicitation in the NOFO, uh, what HUD's policy is on, uh, adopting the higher de minimis, but the chances are if it's going to be no, if, um, they had an opportunity to change that. I absolutely agree. I think you can reach out to HUD and for them to advise on how to um, address the situation. Okay. And a question, the locals must honor the NICRA rate only for their own federal grants. Is that correct? I'm not sure I'm following. Yeah. The, um, meaning the, local government from whom you may get federal pass-through funds, in most cases, they will need to honor your federal NICRA that was negotiated with your cognizant agency, the, the federal agency that you get the your largest uh, federal funding from. Yes. But it's one of the big benefits of getting a NICRA is that, um, many of your other funding sources will be required to adopt it as well. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, and there's a question of, can you please describe further what is classified under the 15% indirect cost? Do you recognize most of operating as indirect? Oh, this is a complicated one. I know it's, your article talks about it extensively. Yeah, yeah. So I would defer the answer to the article. 
Um, but also just emphasize that whether you go de minimis or you go for a NICRA, it is so important for you to be clear and consistent on how you assign costs to direct versus indirect. You want it, you gotta apply it the same and be consistent across the board. It's kind of one of the things I love about the, the NICRA process is that it forces that discipline. And once you're clear, you can more easily apply it across the board, which is, as I mentioned earlier, it's just a best practice. Okay. And there are two questions related to the 15% change. Does the new 15% apply to existing multi-year grants? How does the 15% filter down to the state funders? I will note that this, you know, with the October 1 implementation date, I, my understanding is that many of the agencies are working out exactly how it's going to apply to their grant programs as of now, today. And it's, we're not, I would not be surprised if the public announcement about the how it's going to get done it will come out in time um, and it will be communicated communicated to you only when it is final. So I think people may uh, benefit from being patient to and ask questions directly to the agencies and for those programs on their implementation. Um, and I see it's 258 Eastern at the moment. I'm going to see if there is one more question that I can put in here. Um, or with one remaining uh, minute, Sylvia, I know you're on video. Uh, is there any last word or um, sharing that you'd like to do before we wrap up based on today's conversation? I think that, that I would like to leave people with there are a lot of opportunities. You have to look for them, um, make those connections. It, I don't want it, uh, what I said earlier to be taken as it's going to take a long time to do this. A lot of you already have these relationships with these government entities. You just have to know how to work them and understand um, and, and keep pace with all of the grant opportunities that do um, come out. Um, and hopefully all of you have a grants person who can manage that for you. I think that's the infrastructure question is, you, you know, you need people to manage your grants, hopefully not one, but maybe two or more um, in order to do this work. Um, it, but it is doable and it does result in changes as I've seen it in my tenure from about 30 ish grants to now close to 60. Fantastic. Well, it's time to wrap up. So thank you to all participants who joined today's webinar. We hope it was useful to you and to our speakers who graciously shared their expertise and also my ATJ colleagues, Todd Vanuk and Justin Brooks for supporting the webinar. Please take two minutes to complete the feedback survey that will come up once you exit the program. So this concludes today's webinar. We will stop recording now.